you know, I do enjoy writing, but it's not just about, you know, getting a check or, or just having fun. I have to be able to connect to it personally. And I have to feel like I'm putting something out in the world that is missing. It's time for us to live our lives. Two times back to back. And it was from the back too. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Paley Front Row presented by City. I'm Grace Byers. And I'm Megan Gray. The Paley Center is dedicated to celebrating excellence in media, especially now. To help them continue to bring you outstanding programs like this one, please go to paleycenter.org to donate. We are thrilled to be starring in the newest project from the multi-talented creative powerhouse, Tracy Oliver. Today, we are delighted to be talking to Tracy about her skyrocketing career, which not only includes writing the box office smash hit Girls Trip, but also executive producing and show running two series that she created. The first, The First Wives Club, which is the hit comedy on BET+. And the second, an upcoming Amazon half hour series starring yours truly and my sis, my co-moderator today, Grace Byers. In addition to these shows, Tracy has partnered with BT on Project Create, a nationwide screenplay competition searching for the next great half hour television comedy. We are thrilled to be chatting with Tracy today about all of this and more. Welcome, Tracy! Yay, Tracy! That was really nice. <laughs> We love you. We adore you. That is no secret. We wanted to just jump right into it. Great. So Tracy, when did you know that you wanted to be a writer and who and what were your early inspirations? Um, I would say it wasn't until college, honestly, that I even thought about it. I grew up performing. I was always dancing. I did theater. I was in music and I knew I loved the arts. And so I was always in plays and musicals and I was in the dance team in high school. And so I knew I wanted to do something career-wise that had something to do with the arts, but it never really occurred to me that I would be a screenwriter. And so when I got to college, I was still performing and acting and doing all this stuff in the theater world. And then I just got kind of frustrated because I was always kind of cast as like, you know, the, the Rizzo and Grease kind of character, like the like sassy sidekick. And not that I have any disrespect for Rizzo and Grease. It's like maybe the best character ever. <laughs> I wanted to do something a little more and a little different. And at Stanford, it just wasn't a big arts world. So you kind of had to create your opportunities if you wanted to do something else. And so for me, I was like, all right, I guess I'll have to start, you know, creating my own opportunities. And I took this class called actors who write, writers who act. And in that class was a bunch of writers who had never acted before and actors who had never written. And in that class, I wrote something for the first time for another actor. And it was so, I guess, inspiring for me and refreshing to see that person deliver my words that I thought to myself, maybe there's something here with writing. So that was the first time that I started to write. And then I would write things for myself and then write things for other people. And I just got so much pleasure out of seeing people perform my words that by the time I graduated from college, I was kind of almost totally behind the scenes. I was directing and writing, and writing for women of color. Honestly, those are the people that I was the most inspired by because I was writing stuff that I wanted to originally act in myself. And then it became this an inspiration for me to write for women that needed my voice or women that needed opportunities that other people weren't writing for them. And so I became that person in school that was writing for the women that weren't given an opportunity to act a lot. So that was kind of the, yeah, the first time that I realized that I loved writing. And I guess for inspirations, um, I would say Shonda Rhimes was a, a really big part of my college life. Um, when I was in school is when Grey's Anatomy was first coming out and it was such a hit show. And then when I found out a black woman was behind it, I like, lost. I could not believe that a black woman was the, the genius behind the 
like, amazing show that we all watched in like record numbers from week to week. And that's when I realized, oh, okay, so someone like me can have a, a huge career in television. But she was the first person I think that I connected to something that I was watching in real time. So Tracy, you created and you executive produced the first Wives Club. How did that come to you from BET? <laughs> well, it originally started at Paramount Network. And I, I think this was right after Girls Trip had come out and Paramount was developing a TV series. And not only have I seen the movie, it's one of those movies that me, my mom, and my sister, we all, we all are totally different personalities. And it's like one of the few things that we all love together. And <laughs> so for me, it meant something because I was like, yeah, I, I used to watch this with my mom and my sister. And that's what I said in the meeting. And I was like, I love that movie, why? And they were like, well, we're thinking about rebooting it into a TV series would you be interested in taking it on? And I thought that was a dream. Honestly, I was like, wow, with, with you know, three women in it, and it's a movie that I love, that I've seen before, I would love to figure it out. And I asked them, is it okay if I write it for three black women? <laughs> <laughs> As you guys know, that can be a risky question to ask. But for me, I was like, if I'm gonna do it, I want to do something different and I want to do something that, you know, feels personal to me. And surprisingly they said, yes, absolutely. And at that point I was like, all right, I'm going to go home and I'm going to come up with a take and come up with, you know, new characters and a new way into it. But also that very much so homages like the original movie. Um, Cause I love the movie and I wanted to make sure that I maintained, you know, the through line of that and the heart of it, which, really was about women of a certain age feeling like they're not beautiful anymore and they're not powerful and invisible and all of those things and then rediscovering it what that means for them is three different things but by the end of the series all three of them regain their confidence and their power and you know it's a beautiful friendship story as well so I was really really grateful to get that opportunity. So one of the things that I love about your work, Tracy, is that your repertoire has a through line of writing, producing, creating works that uplift and make space for experiences and stories of Black women. How important is this for and to you? I always consider my writing to be like an activist slash writer. I never just wrote because you know, I, I thought it was fun even. I wrote because it was necessary. And for me, when I was coming up, I just didn't see a lot of stories dedicated to Black women in particular. And so much of our self-esteem and so much of our, you know, how we feel about ourselves is rooted in representation and what's available to us and, and, and what we see image-wise. And um, there was not enough, I think, showing black women in all of their facets, showing that we're silly, showing that we're fun, showing that we love, showing that we marry other <laughs> black people. I felt like black love, I felt like black friendship. All these things were not shown in the media enough. And so for me, it became a priority to be the answer to that, to start writing stuff that I knew if I wanted to see that stuff, other people wanted to see it too. And my world is full of joy and laughter and, and, and love. And it's a lot of black people in my orbit. And when I turn mm -hmm. on the TV, when I was going to the theater, I was like, where, where are all these things that I know exist? And where are all the experiences and the people, you know, my family, my friends, I was not seeing them on screen. And particularly in the comedy space, um, I think people sometimes forget black joy and forget black love and happiness and so that in particular became my thing it was you know no disrespect to the you know the slavery movies and the the biopics you know those are important and they have their place but as black people we're so much more than just struggle and pain and I wanted to make sure that you know the, the stuff that I created at least showed that other part of blackness which is so joyful and such a delight and I so I specialize, honestly, in just stories that I find uplifting and fun and entertaining. And if I can do it with women of color in particular, that's Ooh. when I feel like I'm the most inspired. I love that. 
Um, I want to take it back to the first Wives Club just a little bit. Um, what was that experience like, you know, um, adapting it from, from the book and from the movie? And what do you think is, is different that you put into it? And what were the challenges that you faced along the way? Um, I think the biggest difference is when you're, when you're writing about divorce and you're writing about marriage and it's with black women, um, it takes on a different tone. It takes on, you know, different elements that I think weren't necessarily a part of the original movie. And, you know, what I, what I mean by that is I, even with, um, the character of Hazel, Jill Scott's character, her husband leaves her for a younger, more mixed race version. And then that was something that in, in talking to the writers in the writer's room about, we wanted to talk about colorism and how usually in the black community, the second or third wife is more mixed and younger and more stereotypically attractive because they have Eurocentric features. And we wanted to touch on that because we were like, it's not just that um, Hazel is dealing with her husband leaving her for a younger woman. He's leaving her for a woman that's less black than her and what that means and, and dealing oh. with um, the pain of, of a, a woman over 40 who's also not feeling as beautiful because her husband has decided this version of blackness is more attractive. And so having to kind of unpack that in a writer's room was really painful for us because, you know, it, it's something that we all see in our everyday lives and we have to, you know, deal with, but that's the type of thing that we brought to the new version that was not in the original version. But, you know, the universality of it is that it's just tough being a woman period. And it's, a t it's tough being a woman aging. And that's at the heart of, the original movie, and that's what's at the heart of the TV series, I wanted to make sure we didn't lose, was it's just hard. You yeah. <laughs> have to keep fighting to stay relevant and, and keep fighting to, to feel like you're beautiful and worthy. And women in particular have that so much harder than men. And that was something that I definitely feel like was in the original and in the new one. And it was something that I had to fight for because when I was first approached to do the show with Paramount, they wanted to do it with women in their late 20s and early 30s. And I said, I think you undermine the whole point of the original series if you leave out the age element. Because, you know, at, in your 20s, that's not there. Like you think you're hot, you can't imagine a world in which you feel invisible and feel irrelevant. Uh, Irre irrelevant <laughs> and yeah. yeah for me it was really important to maintain the age part of it because I was like no that's that's the heart of it and that's what I wanted to make sure that we put in the original so those are things that I had to to fight for and um I think you know by the end of it the heart was still there and a lot of people teared up at the end of the first season like I teared up with the movie. So I felt like we did our job with it. And I was really happy with, this, with the show. Mm. I love that. Touching on that just a little bit more, what would you say are your favorite parts of each character's arc in the first season? Well, um, with Brie, who is played by Michelle Buteau, I love that she's the breadwinner. And that was something that I wanted to do in this new iteration because I was like, I know so many boss women who make more than their husbands. And it's not just, you know, a story anymore of a man with money who leaves you behind and you're broke and, and, you know, penniless and you're desperate. And I was like, that's not the 2020 version anymore. The 2020 version is there are women that, you know, work full-time jobs, make more than their husband, husbands have kids and have to deal with the pressure of, you know, trying to balance it all, trying to, you know, be a career woman, but also be there and present for their kids and then also be sexy and romantic and present for their husbands and how hard that is. And so for, for Brie, that's essentially her, her journey and her struggle on, on the show is figuring out the balance 
figuring out how to do it all. And they're really, the answer to that is there is no perfect woman. I wanted to make sure there was a woman that made more than the husband. And we show just how hard that balance is. And with Hazel, who's played by Jill Scott, I just had a lot of fun <laughs> with that character. And I accidentally tapped into a lot of what Jill was going through in real life. And mm. that character was written before she was cast. And <laughs> Jill knew that, but there were so many times where she would pull me aside and be like, whew, you know this is hard for me, right? Because she was going through a divorce and was also dealing with a changing music industry as a woman over 40. And a, a lot of the stuff that I <laughs> wrote into the pilot and into the show, I never for a million years thought Jill was going to play that. I thought it was going to be an actress who can sing. So I never <laughs> thought Jill would play that part. And... So I think the best part of the show for me and for her was how cathartic it was. It was, it was difficult, but she also was able to tap into it because so much of it was her real life. And that was kind of great to see. And, and uh, with Ari, played by uh, Ryan Michelle Bathe, also a lot of interesting real life parallels because in, in that Ari's role in, in, in the series is she plays a kind of boss wife who puts aside her career ambitions to support her very successful husband. And, and I had many conversations with Ryan about Sterling. Her husband is Sterling K. Brown. And she was like, there's so much in here that I can relate to. And with that character and, and, and Ryan's real life, just the balance of having a husband in the same field and, you know, a husband, um, you know, who has his career ambitions and you have yours and what does that look like? And I, I promise this was not ever written for these women, but in a weird way, they all kind of tapped into what in real life, what the characters were. And I think they brought something special to it because they can relate to it. But those are the three different things I wanted to do in the series. Just, just show different types of women and relationships and a more, nuanced way than we'd seen in the movie. So you have partnered with BET for Project Create. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is and what the competition is and what we can expect from it? Yeah, of course. So Project Create um, is an initiative that my production company, Tracy Vaughn Productions, did with BET. And the whole goal behind it, honestly, is just to find the next great comedic voices that are out there. When I talked to BET, I was like, you know what? I want to be able to, to be the person that I didn't have when I was coming up. I would love to find someone out there. And I'm from South Carolina. So for me <laughs> to have made it out here is miraculous, honestly, because there's nobody in my family that's in entertainment. I, had, I have no family at all on the West Coast and no relationships whatsoever. And so I'm in my mind, I'm thinking there might be an amazing writer that's in the Midwest or in the South or wherever that just doesn't know anybody and doesn't know how to make it. And if we can do a competition and open it up wide and discover that voice, and I have an opportunity to, to you know, get on Zoom or whatever and meet with them and help nurture and mentor them, I would love that. So that's basically what it is. And we're looking for specifically comedy writers, since that's what I love doing. And um, yeah, the, the submissions are half hours. We pick it, we pick the top 30, and then we knock it down to one person. And that person gets um, a 25,000 cash prize from BET. And then I develop the show with them. And hopefully, fingers crossed, we get it on the air. So that's the initiative. That's incredible. That's yeah, incredible. I yeah. <laughs> It's amazing. I, I just personally, I just love all that you represent, all that you do. And I think what's so important, just being, you know, a black person in the industry, you are looking for other black people to open the doors and help you get in, you know what I mean? And so it's just you creating that way for people coming up behind you is just priceless. And I love that. Okay. Oh, it's important. Um, yeah, it is. It really is. Um, okay, so just want to talk a little bit about, I guess, being Black in the industry and um, 
just some of the roles and, and stuff that we are, you know, playing and, and that you're mm-hmm. writing. How do you feel about the current representation of Black lives on television right now? Um, what are some of the positives that you think that are happening? And what do you feel like we need to address and cover more? Mm-hmm. I actually feel like, and I hope I don't get flack for this, but I feel like we've made some great progress in the last few years. And I say that as someone, when I was coming out of film school, was told to not write Black characters because there's nowhere to sell them. (laughs) That was literally what I was told. They're like, you can put a Black person within a white show, but if it's all Black characters, I don't know what to do with that. And this was what professors were telling me and producers in the industry that at that point, um, there was nobody like especially in the comedy space in particular there this was pre-blackish this was pre-insecure and and pre-scandal and just pre all of these shows with um black leads in them and pre-empire um and they just didn't exist so people were telling me to stop writing about black characters unless it was within a white show like a white show and i was like that's really depressing and awful. So cut to now and I get to cast you two beautiful ladies and something and I'm blown away by it. I'm so inspired that I get a chance to do something that honestly is a dream. I'm grateful for being able to write about black women and cast just wonderful black women who you know are across the industry and coming out of film school and being told that I couldn't do that and then being able to on multiple networks and you know covering different aspects of black womanhood too you know because you guys are in a, a show on amazon that's very much skewed towards dating and figuring out your career stuff and you guys are are part of the the pre first wives era like they're very much into you know uh motherhood and like firmly in their 40s and a different part of life and I get to do a different you know stage in in this Amazon show and then I look at you know Insecure and Atlanta and you know Empire and there's all these different shows and what Lena Waithe is doing there's so many different black creators right now and I think you know it's a really great time I really do so I want to point that out first because I think sometimes it's easy to just say it's everything's not going well. And I don't think that that's 100% the case. I think we've made a lot of progress. I think where there's room to improve are the behind the scenes. Um, I think the biggest thing for me as a black showrunner has been discovering, you know, the the lack of black players, black editors, um, black line producers, (laughs) And you can be on a black show and then show up on set and you hear a handful of you. And I, I think that's really unfortunate. And what I was trying to do, you know, with First Wives was figure out why that is. And that was my first time running a show. And so I just had no idea that those numbers were so low. And so right. I've just been trying to figure out, like, how do you fix that? Because I, I do think... It's, it's problematic when you do have a show that's diverse and then your diverse cast and your diverse writers show up on set to work and there's nobody that looks like them on the set. So I think that's where I would say that there's improvement. Um, but as far as you know, actors on screen and black creators and black showrunners starting to get an opportunity to put shows out there, I think we definitely have seen progress. Um. So I just have one more, one more last question that I think is really important because, you know, I, I, me and Grace both are so thankful to be working with you and we're both so inspired by you. It's, it's such a beautiful thing to like watch you walk around set and for you to have the audacity to just be great, you know, and to just yeah. be um, the leader of this ship. And so um, what would you give um, aspiring writers that want to get into the business or have started writing, but they're not sure if they're good at it or just trying to pursue their dreams? What would be um, advice that you would give them along this journey? Hmm. I mean, there's so many 
things to do. I mean, for me, Awkward Black Girl kind of was something that Issa and I did because we had to. We both went to undergrad together and we did theater and stuff in undergrad and she directed me and I directed her and I wrote for her and she wrote for me. So we always had this kind of back and forth um, collaboration. And when we finished um, undergrad, she went to New York and I went to um, grad school in LA. And then we both finished at the same time of fears. She came back to LA right when everyone was telling us black people couldn't be on TV. And we both felt very depressed and discouraged about being told that because we both wanted specifically to write about black people. And so instead of, you know, taking that no, you know, she told me she had this idea for Awkward Black Girl. And I was like, oh, that sounds hilarious. I would love to work on that with you. So that was my first time show running. Um, but I hired a crew and, you know, hired a couple of writers. And by the end of it, you know, we had gotten, you know, New York Times and CNN and like all these different major publications had started profiling it. And I never thought for a second that it would reach those heights and become this like web phenomenon phenomenon that it did. But um, what I realized in hindsight and what I always tell new people coming in is that don't take a no. Like don't let anybody tell you that your story or your journey or experience is, is irrelevant or it doesn't matter. You know, go ahead. If you believe in it, whether it's doing a web series, whether it's doing a reading of it or, you know, a, a play, there's so many different mediums and ways to get your work out there. And it doesn't matter where you're from and your background and experience, because if something's really good and the right person has an opportunity to see it, you know, that's something all it takes. So, yeah, I mean, I think you just, the, this industry is not for um, really sensitive people as far as uh, <laughs> rejection and criticism, because I cannot tell you how many no's I've gotten it seems like I've not gotten a lot of no's, but I mostly got no's until recently. And so, yeah, you just can't take a no. And if you can channel that rejection into inspiration and use that as, you know, fuel to fight for something and to figure out a creative way of being heard no matter what, that'll do more for you than, you know, just to sit at your laptop and write, 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 and then, you know, get one no and then decide to throw it out. Like, that's not the way this industry works. You have to keep trying. And I know that it sounds so cliche, but that's what I had to do each time I got a no was to figure out how to turn that no into a yes by making it and proving you wrong. Mm -hmm. And that you did. <laughs> yeah. More than once. Yeah. Many yeah. Times to come. yeah. Thank you for joining us for this Paley Front Row conversation presented by City and special thanks to our guest, Tracy Oliver. And please be sure to support the Paley Center and consider becoming a Paley member by visiting PaleyCenter.org. Take care, guys, and thanks so much for joining us. Thanks thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. I appreciate it. Thank you.